everyone to the opening webinar of the Enrich Your Knowledge series. Um, I, my name is Nigel Wagstaff. I work on innovation at AATRIS, which is the RI for translational medicine research. Um, and I will be trying to guide you and moderate through this webinar, which will discuss the ILO and ICO roles. Um, a few housekeeping things, first of all, uh, would you please use the chat box during the presentations if you have questions, which we will then address later. Uh, at the end of all the presentations, there will be a question and answer session um, when you will at that point be able to put your questions to the speakers. I'm trying to scroll down and it doesn't go. To the right. Click on your slide and to the right. If you click on your slide, you should have arrows coming to. Ah, okay, yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, the program for today is four speakers, five speakers, in fact, because Anshalad Schubert will introduce the whole webinar series to you. And then we have four speakers, two representing the uh, ICO industry contact officer roles, and two representing the ILO. Um, liaison officer roles, industry liaison officer roles. These are the speakers and I will shortly introduce them to you. Some housekeeping rules. Um, the session is being recorded um, so we can uh, extract as much information from it as possible. By remaining in the meeting you are consenting to it being recorded. Um, please uh, disable your camera um, during the presentations. Um, and activate it again during question and answer, and also mute your microphones uh, and use the chat box during the presentations. Um, I give the floor now to Anne-Charlotte Schubert, who is coordinator of the Enrich project, to introduce with this slide the, the webinar series of which this is the first. Anne-Charlotte. Yeah, thank you very much, Nigel, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all in this new Enrich activity, Enrich Your Knowledge. We're very excited to launch this first series of webinar today and see the great interest uh, you've shown for this event. I think we have close to 50 registries, so that's very nice. But before telling more about this new activity, I would like to briefly introduce myself to those who don't already know me. So I'm Angela Joubert. I'm an ex expert on EU funding programs. Uh, I worked as a grant officer at the European Spallation Source uh, here in the south of Sweden. Uh, and I'm the project coordinator of Enrich. Uh, Enrich is a, an H2020 funded project, uh, organized a consortium of 11 partners represented by both ILOs and ICOs, so industry liaison and contact officers. Within this project, we aim at building a permanent European network of uh, ILOs and ICOs and to enable industry to become um, a full partner of research infrastructures, whether as a supplier, as a user, or as a co-creator. Uh, with Enrich Your Knowledge, uh, this is a series of online training and organizational uh, webinars targeted to experts involved in setting up collaborations between research infrastructures and industry, so such as the ILOs and ICOs. The overall aim of this webinar series is to share knowledge, expertise skills, and best practices among ILOs and ICOs. So I hope you will enjoy and learn a lot during this webinar today. And uh, please uh, don't hesitate to have an active participation with using um, the chat or raising your hands. And I think I hand back to you, Nigel. Thank you very much, Anne-Charlotte. Thanks. Um, the scope of this webinar is to discuss the ILO and ICO roles and uh, aspects of, of that. Um, as you may know, ILOs are appointed by member states and associated countries to stimulate collaboration among the in national industry and the international RIs. And ICOs are from the RIs in charge of developing business relations with all potential industrial and other users and suppliers. And one of the main goals of the Enrich project, uh, which requires us to um, 
to take some time today to look at these roles is that we will get more from the network of ILOs and ICOs working together um, and in that way hopefully exploit the full potential of RI industry interaction. So that is the scope of the webinar. We have four speakers which I will uh, introduce to you now quickly representing the ICO role Chris Deacon of Beatrice, Business Development Manager, uh, who has been involved extensively with the actress in forging collaborations between expert academic groups and biotech and pharmaceutical companies to enable drug development and, and other medical advances. Uh, a second ICO speaker is Francisca de Jong, uh, and she represents the S3 domain of social and cultural innovations. So we've had healthcare with Chris and now social and cultural innovations. Francisca is director of Clarin, um, located, centered in the Netherlands, um, has worked um, formerly with Philips uh, and is a member of advisory boards of small and medium enterprises, SMEs, offering tools for search and language processing and involved in a number of European programs. On the ILO side, we have, first of all, Gerard Cornet, <coughs> who is coordinator of the network of industry liaison officers, ILOs, in the Netherlands. Um, he works at the Dutch, at the Netherlands Institute for Space Research and is involved in a number of uh, tasks in the Enrich program relating to ILO ICO uh, performance and uh, roles. And finally, Javier Echavari um, from Spain, um, representing the ILO uh, network. Um, he works at CDTI, which is a Spanish innovation agency belonging to the Ministry of Science and Innovation, whose main mission is to promote and support industrial R&D uh, and CDTI. He's industry liaison officer for the European Southern Observatory, if I got it right, and the um, square kilometer array astronomy projects. So those are our speakers. And I would then give the floor to Chris Teakin for his first presentation. So I will stop sharing and invite Chris. Can I Joe? Yes. Um, let me see. Does this work for everybody? Can you, yes, can it you does. Thank you. I can see it. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yes. perfect. Good. Perfect. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Chris Tegan, uh, Business Development Manager at Eatris. Uh, my background is as a scientist. I have a PhD in tumor cell biology. Um, so, Eatris is a research infrastructure for translational medicine. What that means is, is it's basically research where the goal is to get things from the lab to the patient. So, not fundamental research. So our main activities are either a consortium building for large EU grants, uh, because we're in an ideal position to identify suitable academic groups for a consortium. Uh, but we also build research collaborations with biotech and pharma companies, which I'll explain a bit about later. And we also have a so-called hub model where we build permanent collaborations between one or maybe more big pharma companies and multiple academic groups. So we are in the life sciences, uh, established in uh, 2014. And currently we have 110 research institutes in 14 countries. And Croatia has just joined as an observer country, so that should actually be 15. Uh, we have about 18 FTE in a main coordination and support hub in Amsterdam at the VU Medical Center. And in various uh, countries, we also have national coordinators. So just to give you a bit of background, how, how, how drug development works, and I'll keep it very short. So there's big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, what they do is basically buy out early clinical stage biotech companies. And so they kind of outsource early drug development and discovery. They only buy things that have already been developed up to a certain point. So then there's biotech companies that are simply smaller pharmaceutical companies, if you will. So they, they serve as sort of IP creation vehicles. So usually it's very a small team and they tend to outsource everything. So they use commercial service providers to outsource stuff. And sometimes it's only a few patents and it's two people. They don't even have a lab. But there's also, they have a lot of collaborations with academia and that's where uh, Iatris plays a big role. 
Um, so the, the, the things that we that we work on is so industry for us is mostly a user. So at the Atlas we have uh, certain platforms based on specific technology, and so, some of these terms might not mean much to you, and maybe they do. But I'll go through them quickly. So there's things like what we call advanced ther therapy, medicinal product. Those are those are gene therapy and cell therapy technologies or facilities to produce those. So we find academic groups and sub collaborations with. Uh, companies, but we do things with biomarkers. So these can be biobank facilities, but also things like DNA sequencing, and these can get very complicated. Uh, we do a lot of projects with imaging and tracing, so clinical imaging and tracing. So this can be PET or MRI uh, facilities, or these radioactive tracers that you use to follow certain molecules or antibodies throughout the body, and it can be in animal or humans. Uh, we also have a platform on small molecules, so this can be either uh, advanced certain screening uh, facilities or certain mouse models or, or cell models that can be used to, to validate these models. And we also have a platform for vaccines, uh, which admittedly has become a bit more relevant uh, recently. So for me, the, the aspects of the ICO role is uh, what, what, what I do is I need to identify biotech or pharmaceutical companies that are in need of very specific academic expertise that we can potentially find in our network. So for this, uh, the, the most effective thing to do is go to industry partnering events. So these are conferences that don't necessarily revolve around the talks, but they revolve around the ability to have one-on-one -on -one meetings. And there's actually a lot of these events. They usually called Bio or Bio Europe or BioFit. They always kind of have Bio in the, in the title. But there's an online portal where you can uh, request a meeting and if people say yes then you automatically get a location and a time slot uh, so that actually works out great you can speak to a lot of people that way our business model is is that if a company comes to us um, and they're looking for a um, you know want to do an imaging study for instance then if we are successful and that success is setting up a collaboration agreement between a company and an institute we charge a five percent success fee based on the on the budget of the project but sometimes we do freebie things. For instance, there are companies that develop new assays or new reagents or something. Then we look for academic groups that want to test them out for free and provide feedback. And that's very beneficial for both groups. Uh, but sometimes for free, we also provide uh, experts to just have, a, have an interview with. So what's always tricky is, is who to talk to at the industry level, right? So my experience is that with these smaller biotech companies, I mean, there's only a handful of people on the team anyway. So, so usually the CEO or the chief scientific officer is the right person to talk to because they know what's going on. If companies get larger, then, then you need to reach out to the business development department. Uh, but what's also interesting for us is uh, investment funds and charities can be uh, good partners to talk to because they will have a portfolio of multiple companies, small companies they've invested in, and they want them to succeed. And those companies are also looking for uh, academic collaboration. So you can sort of um, increase your audience, if, if you will. Uh, I wanted to share with you a bit, and these, this data is a bit outdated, but it didn't change much. Who is actually our, our user? What is, what is our user profile? So actually about half of the project we do, we do for academia themselves. They're looking for a specific academic groups that have certain expertise. About a third is uh, smaller biotech companies, 11% is big pharma projects, and about 2% of those are, are, are funders, so these are usually charities that are looking for, for very specific academic expertise. Uh, I just wanted to give you one example of, of, of a fairly big project that we set up. So this is uh, this is a partnership, a long-term partnership with uh, GSK. So that's a big pharma company and six Iatris institutions. And the idea is that uh, this is a what we call multi-site collaboration where this revolves around clinical imaging. The idea is for clinical imaging, you need the imaging facility. So you need the MRI machine or the PET scanner, but you also need radioactive isotopes with a short half-life and you need patients. So usually you need to have those things in the same building. So that happens at uh, medical, university medical centers. So, so basically what we did, is we set up a collaboration agreement where all the contracts are in place, at least the basis of them. So if 
GSK comes to us with a project where they want to do a certain clinical imaging study, we can start really quickly because we know as good as it, the contracts have been pre-negotiated up to a certain point. Um, so this works really well for, for, for both sides and we uh, manage this project by Amsterdam. Um, yeah, that's where I wanted to, to uh, stop here. Um, there's many things to talk about, of course, but let's, let's keep that for the discussion. And I'll be happy to uh, discuss any and all tips and tricks with you at the end of the session. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, very clear, very succinct. Um, there was one question that may be um, from, from Claudia Fondo, which maybe we could answer now, and that is about the business model and the extent to which you're involved in setting up um, uh, uh, research uh, agreements. Um, yeah. And I think perhaps it's important to add a bit, maybe do that, that uh, AATIS is a non-profit um, and the fees represent only a very small part of, of our turnover. Maybe you could say more about that. Ah, yeah, I'm looking at the chat now. So, so um, basically some member states pay a membership fee so that covers most of the, the costs of running our central office in Amsterdam. Uh, we have an in-house legal counsel, so uh, she can help us with uh, support us with, with legal support. But in the end, we create a collab uh, we set up an agreement between a company on one side and an academic institute on the other side. And we are not a partner of that agreement. We do sign a separate agreement with the company that will allow us to invoice 5% on the project budget if we're able to set up um, a collaboration with them. And uh, they like that because it's sort of no cure, no pay. If we can't find what they're looking for, then uh, they're not out of any money. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. I think that we, there were two questions. I think that probably covers them. Um, I uh, would like now to uh, invite um, our second speaker, Francesca de Jong from Clarin, but um, I think she needs to, I'm still sharing my screen for some reason. It seems I'm sharing now as well. Okay. Is it, is my slide, my starting slide visible for everybody? Yes, it's fine. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you for, uh, for the Enrich team uh, to set up this. Uh, well, no, no, wait, I'm going to just the zoom. Okay, uh, for setting up this, need to kill. So, uh, for setting up this um, this series and, uh, and inviting me to play a role. So, um, as, as Nigel, Nigel said, I'm uh, uh, executive director of one of Europe's ERICs, and it's actually one of the ERICs in the domain that in S3 context is called cultural and social innovation, but that uh, in other uh, circles is better known as um, the domain of social sciences and humanities. Um, as a director of an organization, I'm, I'm not an ICO, though there are elements of an ICO role uh, that are part of my tasks. and. Uh, this is already pointing to a very specific feature of the SSH domain and, and uh, the way in which research infrastructures in that domain uh, are able to organize their uh, liaison with industry. So my, in my uh, introduction, I will uh, address three issues. The way uh, in SSH, uh, in the SSH domain, the RIs connect to their stakeholders, uh, some of the fe features of the SSH domain that determine the context for um, the ICO role and a little bit of um, how, uh, uh, yeah, how um, industry can play a role in the activities of RIs. So first of all, the connection with the stakeholders. And I try to introduce that by pointing you um, to um, uh, Clarin, which is only one of the research infrastructures in the social sciences and humanities, but how we deal with um, what kind of data types we, um, um, we offer and what kind of communities we, uh, we aim to serve. And especially the diversity there is the, the point that I would like to raise your awareness for. So in social sciences and humanities, there are many, many data types. Um, um, 
most of the ones listed here on the left hand side typically play a role in um, or have been generated in the context of uh, the humanities. But of course, um, uh, there are also data sets that typically uh, origin from uh, social sciences, such as survey data or even healthcare, such as patient recordings. And then the domains served by offering these data sets in a structure manage manner uh, are listed on the, on the right hand side. I'm not going into detail, but um, it's maybe good to point out that apart from the typical SSH disciplines, there's also a role for data science and uh, fields like artificial intelligence that are interconnected with um, uh, the SSH domain. Um, how do we connect to our stakeholders? Well, first of our first group of stakeholders is actually the research communities. That may be true for all our eyes, but it's good to keep that in mind. Our primary role is to serve research communities to help them um, to uh, set up excellent uh, research tracks. And uh, um, the, the research communities that, that we serve uh, typically consist of, on the one hand, uh, tool developers, uh, people that develop, for example, speech recognition engines or text mining tools or um, uh, survey platforms. Um, um, so tool developers on the one hand and data providers on the other hand. And then as a second uh, category, the users of all those developers and uh, develop, developed tools and, and data sets. Um, then um, our connection with industry uh, traditionally is very strong uh, in the sense that the, in the early days of the, the tech industry, lots of insights um, were fueled by uh, the field of natural language processing and computer science and, and, and uh, linguistics. Um, so if you use search engines or a machine translation systems or speech recognition uh, or text mining, there's a lot of uh, natural language uh, uh, expertise and, um, and, and models underneath. So uh, these industries were built up with a lot of knowledge from the domain that I represent. Um, for research infrastructure, it's still not easy to uh, uh, turn this uh, natural link into um, uh, a working relationship uh, starting from the structure of a research infrastructure. I get back to that later. We also have a lot of collaboration traditionally with SMEs um, because some of the um, big uh, technology fields are very dependent on uh, dedicated developments done by SMEs um, for translation services, for workflows based on speech recognition, for matching tools, for recruitment, etc. And they typically um, can make use of, of the knowledge that is available in, uh, in the domain of SSH. Uh, or language technology um, in the wider sense. There's also a strong potential for collaboration with the public sector, in particular the GLAM sector, such as galleries, libraries, archives and museums. That's not called industry, but is one of the non-academic uh, application domains for the kind of research structure, infrastructures that I represent. And of course, there are the funders, the countries that provide the basic uh, um, finances for the running of an ERIC and the European Commission that provides funding for uh, some of the projects that we run. Now about the specific uh, aspects of the uh, ICO role, the ICO role in, in SSH, because there are some futures in the domain that determine what kind of um, uh, uh, elements play a role in, in how to shape that role. So first of all, I, I again give the example of Claren, but it's just an example. Um, and it's quite similar to Eatris. Uh, Claren is a, a distributed research infrastructure. So uh, we are consisting of uh, uh, in total 24 countries and uh, another linked party uh, distributed over Europe and beyond. And um, because of this model or linked to this model is the fact that we actually are a network of over 60 centers, uh, some of which are uh, smoothly running data centers. Um, 25 of our centers are certified by Core Trust Seal, which is an independent certification organization for data centers. So uh, a major part of the work done in Clarin is actually done and offered 
through um, the participating nodes in the countries. And in order to make that run, we have a model for federated uh, uh, login. We have a central metadata harvesting uh, tool that uh, enables easy discovery of the services that we have, so the data and the tools. And there are um, uh, models in place to chain the various services to support specific workflows. Um, but I want to point you to the fact that we are a distributed research infrastructure and that, that many of the nodes have a very independent position that uh, is not in terms of their sustainability dependent on, on Clarin as such. They're just nodes within universities or uh, other academic institutes, uh, which means that um, uh, the ICO role is not just played by the central organization called ERIC, but it's actually a role that is has to be shaped in the network of distributed data repositories, which means that actually the research infrastructure is acting as a broker because this I ICO role is distributed over the entire network. Another specific element for SSH, which may also be true for others, is that we have a strong focus on open access to data and tools, which means that um, the services the data services and the tooling is not something that we can sell um, because our services are developed in open source. Um, another important feature is that lots of the knowledge existing in the domain of SSH um, uh, can be transferred to, um, to uh, commercial sectors, but this is the biggest sector there might even uh, might be the rather fragmented sector uh, that you could indicate with the labels communication and media. So it's not uh, something that is easily organized and also an, uh, seldomly something that comes with big um, uh, project in terms of uh, financial volume. Um, looking from the side of the uh, uh, ILOs and, and maybe industry, uh, they typically don't have a strong focus on SSH unless they know where the experts are. And they are not at the level of ERIC, but they are um, so not on the, the central level, but the, the real experts are based in the countries. Maybe this is the reason why the ILOs typically don't have a strong focus or, not, or no focus at all, nor even awareness at all of the fact that there are SSH research infrastructures. And it's maybe also good to mention that in our field, we also have other infrastructural initiatives um, or uh, initiatives that, that are working towards a sort of uh, infrastructural role. For example, there is a complementary network uh, of academic groups that aim to collaborate with industry, mainly on machine translation. Now, the last topic, uh, understanding of the roles of industry. Um, and then we distinguish, uh, 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 sorry, I see here. Okay, uh, industry as a user. Um, so for us, industry uh, can be a supplier, but uh, we see much more potential for industry as a user. So we can provide them uh, advice on how to use data to generate models for uh, techniques such as machine translation, speech recognition, artificial intelligence, etc. We can advise them on how to handle heterogeneous data. So in a uh, combination of, for example, sensor data with, uh, with text data or a combination of uh, spoken data with written data, etc. And also we can give um, advice on how to do data curation for um, language resources or survey data. And in all cases, um, uh, there's always a, for, for dedicated uh, applications, um, um, a lot of work to do around terminology harmonization and there we can uh, provide guidance. For industry as supplier, um, is, uh, an interesting observation is that there are many tools around commercial software that, uh, that are used by uh, academics and that are relevant for the role that we play as a research infrastructure. Um, Often they, uh, they are provided through campus licenses um, and also um, uh, for certain other uh, needs that we have, uh, 
we make use of uh, commercial services from, for example, providers of certification services or for, or for providers of uh, permanent uh, data identifiers. Um, but this is not something um, that is typically uh, organized in such a way that we, we can uh, call this uh, a systematic uh, manner of collaboration between ICO and industry. Uh, the, the third role, and here something went wrong with uh, the place of the bullet, the third role is of course that of industry as co-creator. Um, again, um, we, uh, in our strategy we uh, have the intention to um, uh, develop uh, this potential model for collaboration uh, in the coming years, but uh, here we uh, we expect uh, to learn a lot from the, um, uh, how to say that, the fact that uh, our strategy period and, uh, and the project and rich um, uh, are in the same, have the same time horizon. So by the end of Enrich, we hope to have some good recommendations on how to set up that element in our collaboration with industry. I think that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. A very interesting uh, talk about an in, in, interesting and uh, unusual area of, uh, of activity. Um, I would uh, like to uh, ask everybody to make uh, use of the chat and at the end we will come back and answer any, any chat questions that have not already been answered. But on that issue, I'm looking at it now and I see that some questions have been asked and already answered by the participants, which is excellent. So thank you very much indeed. That's really working the way we want it to work. Um, so please help each other if, if you know the answer to, to one of the questions or if you have an interesting link. Thanks to the people who have been doing that. Um, so I would now like to invite the first of the ILO speakers Gerard Cornet to give his presentation. So we move from ICOs to ILOs. Gerard. Right. <clears throat> Can you see my presentation? Is it in the right mode? No, we see it in slide mode, not in presentation mode. Now you see it in presentation mode. Yes, perfect, thanks. Okay, uh, thanks for the invitation. I am Gerard Cornet. I'm the coordinator of the, the Dutch ILO network, which um, originated as a bottom-up bottom approach, uh, bottom-up initiative in the Netherlands. Um, and I'll, I'll, explain that, uh, I'll explain that later. Um, as Nigel said, this is uh, the first presentation about the ILO role. Uh, this is, I'm going to present you the situation in the Netherlands and uh, Javier is doing that for, for Spain. So I'll start with uh, uh, the explanation of what, what is an ILO. And in fact, the survey that was done uh, a few months ago in the framework of ENRICH shows us that there are many types of, of ILOs and it is difficult um, to fit the ILO role in one complete definition. Uh, at least what uh, ILOs have in common is that uh, they serve both, both the, uh, the research infrastructure and the local industry but in different ways. And these ways are more or less dependent on uh, local priorities, uh, the existence of, of uh, well-developed ecosystems, so to say. Um, and sometimes, um, well, also the connection between the different stakeholders in, uh, in, in, in the countries. Um, some ILOs are officially appointed, but uh, at least that's not the situation in, in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, uh, ILOs uh, perform tasks as part of another job, 
And um, well, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, this task ca can come up as a sort of bottom-up initiative. And this task is not always directed by, uh, by an employer. So uh, Javier and I chose to, um, to uh, present more or less, uh, let's say, uh, two extremes, um, perhaps two extremes. Uh, in the Netherlands, it's a typical bottom-up activity and uh, ILOs are not officially appointed in contrast to the situation in, uh, in, in Spain. And what we are talking about in the, in the Netherlands is that uh, uh, the, the, the ILOs in the Netherlands are mainly concerned with large infrastructures in the, in the physical sciences. Well, this is an example. <clears throat> This is the way uh, ESO sees the role of an ILO. And uh, obviously this is emphasizing the need to attract industrial suppliers from the member states. Um, and this, this is uh, more or less the same for other research infrastructures as well. Well, um, this result of the, this is from the, from the Enrich uh, survey that was done a few months ago, or I already mentioned. And uh, this shows that more than a third of ILOs belong to a government agency. Another more than third belongs to a public research organization. And as I already mentioned, I will highlight the second category and uh, Javier will highlight the first. The ILONET in the Netherlands. Uh, we are with approximately 10 people and the ILONET was founded around 2010 to share resources and expertise and jointly organize the dialogue between science and industry. Um, and since 2012, the Dutch research organization, NWO, has been supporting the ILO net. Uh, let me explain the, the NWO organization. That is the Dutch funding uh, and research organization. And it's in fact the umbrella for nine research institutes. Uh, and uh, many of them can be considered as a home base for research infrastructures. And these institutes, the research, uh, these institutes are uh, primarily curiosity driven in their research. And NWO, I think that's important to, uh, to realize, uh, NWR is accountable to the science ministry and the support that the ILONET uh, gets from NWO is in the form of a back office and a coordinate, uh, coordinator um, and that's, uh, that's me. Um, as I already mentioned already, <clears throat> Uh, the ILOs in the Netherlands, um, well, have been active since uh, the engagement in big science. So the first ILOs uh, were for ESO, ESA, CERN and ITER. Um, and the ILOs are not officially recognized and there is no official job description. I think that's something that we should keep in mind. Uh, from the ILO net perspective, and of course there are different perspectives at stake, um, we are, um, we are, we are uh, working in a curiosity driven environment. And uh, this determines to a large extent the requirements for the development of research facilities and high-tech instrumentation. Um, there are severe challenges for industry. Um, 
and the industry experiences many barriers uh, to easily access or operate on the market of big science. And in that sense, uh, you can say that consumer markets are easier to handle compared to the big science market. Um, from the other end, companies want to be engaged from the start of the innovation chain and be involved in low TRL, high tech development. And that's where the, the first uh, perspective arises. Uh, big science needs industry, but industry doesn't necessarily need science. And that's something to keep in mind also. We uh, published a position paper about the barriers of uh, that, that, that industry companies uh, experience in entering, accessing the big science market. The second one, there is no applied science if there is no science to apply. Uh, well, that has obviously to do with the fact that uh, uh, we, are, we are looking at the entire innovation chain. So this starts with low TRL developments in, uh, in, in technology development. And you need this first part in the innovation chain to realize innovation. That's the perspective from our ILOMnet. And that's the basis for the activities of the, of the ILOs. Um, from the institute's perspective, so the, the, the employers of the, of the ILOs, um, it's most important to, in, to, to increase the uh, availability of companies for co-development and valorization. That's, I think, the priority for most of our research institutes. And uh, the perspective, the more general perspective, you could say the national economic perspective is that uh, uh, geo return should be increased and uh, innovation should be stimulated. So that's the perspective uh, from, from, let's say the national, the national level uh, looking at the activities of, uh, of islands. Well, Obviously, ILOs, um, um, what are the requirements for ICOs, for, for ILOs in our, in our situation? Um, obviously that, well, they, they should have technical expertise, obviously. Um, they should be able to exchange information, experience and knowledge with each other. Um, they should have knowledge about procurement rules and um, they should be loved by both scientists and companies, of course. And again, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not an official job description. It has been, well, originated during, during uh, the years that we are uh, working as, uh, as an island. Well, I already mentioned uh, the, the distinctive roles and um, I think it's fair to say that um, each institute can have a somewhat different focus. Um, so sometimes the focus is on geo return, raising geo return, uh, but it can also be uh, that an institute uh, focuses more on, on co-development or technology transfer and valorization. But at least at the level of uh, the network, um, we see a cross fertilization between these different uh, roles and uh, this cross fertilization has an added value in, uh, in our perspective. Well, activities, um, well, I think that's, uh, that compares well to, uh, to, to, to any other ILO organization in, uh, in, in, in the European countries. Um, uh, we have a, it's good to mention that we have a company brochure. Uh, we organize, of course, uh, representations of, of industry uh, at the, the locations of the research infrastructures. Um, we are partner in a REACH, of course, and a member of PERIA and we participate in the, the BSBF.
Of course, we have ambitions. Um, although we are all already uh, 10 years existing, we still have ambitions. ambitions. And um, I mentioned here a few on this slide and uh, perhaps it's good to explain that the, the, the ambitions I marked red in this slide um, are ambitions that we cannot realize ourselves. Um, the ILONET is acting uh, primar primarily at an, uh, at an operational level. Uh, but we have concluded in the, in the past years that uh, we need a better ecosystem to involve all the stakeholders in the big science domain. And eventually this, this, this should result in, uh, in, in, in more geo return, more innovation and more uh, knowledge transfer. So um, we see, and that, that, that's always that's that's also uh, I think a, a, a major result from the Enrich survey, is that there are different approaches to the ILO role. If you are looking at governmental agencies, they tend to focus uh, on the on the downstream part of the innovation chain. They are driven by societal challenges, geo return, and clear business cases, um, and that's in contrast more or less with research institutes that are driven by science cases. And they need new key enabling te technologies to, uh, to push frontiers. Um, and they have a prime focus on the upstream part of the innovation chain. And I think that the challenge is, uh, is, is to, to uh, looking at the innovation chain to connect the, the upstream part with the downstream part. Um, well, that's it. And the other perspective comes from uh, Javier. Gerard, thank you very much indeed. Um, very clear introduction to the ILO role. Um, I would um, invite you and the other speakers to um, answer questions on the chat. Um, there was one question uh, to you, Gerard, relating to the not being officially recognized in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Alan Silverman, I think, asked, uh, not recognized by who? So maybe you could look at that, otherwise we can come back to it in the discussion session later on. But let's use the chat uh, as a question and answer as we go on. Thank you again. Um, and I invite uh, Javier to give his presentation on the ILO role. Thank you, Nigel. I hope you can see my screen correctly now. So um, when Gerard and me, we were planning this presentation, we thought it would be nice, as he said, to provide the double perspective on the different flavors that the ILO role has depending on where we work. Uh, Gerard has, has explained the perspective that comes from the science, from the perspective of, of ILOs employed by research institutions. Whereas I will try to provide you with a picture of how we work and what are our priorities uh, as an example of ILOs working for uh, belonging to a governmental agency like CDTI. And then I will show you some results of the, of the survey, which more or less match the the individual uh, conclusions that, that get out of the knee have reached. So, as I say, um, I work for CDTI. CDTI is uh, the Spanish Innovation Agency, which is dependent on the Ministry of Science and Innovation. And uh, all the research infrastructures in, in which Spain participates in the big science areas, such as CERN, Fusion for Energy, uh, ESO, SKA, ESRF, and so on, which have ILOs. These ILOs, uh, uh, are, we work at CDTI. In total, we are three full-time ILOs. And uh, as I say, we are employed by CDTI and, and the mission of, of this agency of CDTI has several missions. One of them is providing 
companies with uh, R&D funding tools to improve their competitiveness and so on in the form of loans, grants, and tax exemptions. We also, in CDTI, foster uh, uh, international particip participation in international R&D programs, such as Horizon Europe. And we also manage the national branch of international programs like Eureka or Eurostars. We also promote uh, international business technology, technology transfer through, through, through several uh, instruments. And we have support services for technological innovation. In CDTI, we also support startups via uh, special grants that we give for, for tech startups. And in, in our area, we support companies working for as a supplier for research infrastructures. And also we are the representatives in, in ESA, in the European Space Agency. So uh, as ILOs in Spain, we have, we have let's say, uh, our responsibilities are threefold. First of all, we have DUTs which deal with the relationships with research infrastructures. We also have, uh, have responsibilities towards industry. And finally, we, we have a, a very permanent interaction with our ministry. So with the research infrastructures, with CERN, with Fusion for Energy, with, ES, with ESO, with all the research infrastructures for which we are ILOs, we are the official context point for all the industrial matters. We also take part in the ILO meetings and in the finance committees as experts. And this is something that is very valuable to us, all this information and this interaction that we have in these finance committees. We are the source for these research infrastructures for the national industrial capabilities. And on the right, you can see a screenshot of the catalog, similarly to what Gerard explained, our catalog for capacities uh, as industry as a supplier for large scientific facilities. We usually update this catalog every, every two, three years, and it tries to show a complete picture of all the references and all the capabilities that our industries have to work as suppliers of big science facilities. And we also uh, assist and work to, to make collaboration agreements between national research infrastructures or, or research institutes, uh, industry, which is our side, let's say, in CDTI, and, and research infrastructures, such as, for example, a collaboration agreement that we have with CERN and FIEMAT, which is a national uh, laboratory to develop uh, high-end magnets for CERN. We also have, of course, our main work is, is dealing with interactions with industry. So we distribute opportunities. We make tenders known to industry through our newsletters, through the web pages, through social media, and so on. And we also try to involve industry to develop long term strategies in order to work for research infrastructures. Uh, in what regards to specific tenders, we provide support for tender preparation. We help companies search for partners, both nationally and internationally, using the ILO networks. We organize industrial days and visits, visits to research infrastructures. And very important, we support our national industries to get ready for complex technological tenders through the, the R&D funding tools that we have available in CDTI for industry. For running contracts, we monitor, we monitor Spanish contracts. We provide supports when dealing with research infrastructures. And we also uh, have a very close monitoring of the geo return in the different research infrastructures. And finally, as I already said, we, we have the catalog of the industry of capabilities. And towards the ministry, we really are, uh, let's say, the ministry's arm in all matters which deal with, with uh, industry, with, with how industry can benefit from Spanish participation in research infrastructures. So we provide support for the strategy. We define the in-kind contributions when, when you know that for some research infrastructures, there, there's no cash contribution, but there are in-kind contributions, so we help 
uh, analyze the capabilities of our industries and see what kind of in-kind contributions are best for the interests of Spain. And finally, we also provide support for, uh, for, for research infrastructures which have the possibility of being built in Spain. For example, uh, if MIF Dones, which as you know, uh, will probably, probably be built in Granada. So we provide analysis, we analyze the industrial capabilities and, and we try to promote them through our funding instruments. So as you see, we have this threefold activity with the, with the different stakeholders. Concerning our KPIs, and this is where I think we, we can start to find some differences towards what uh, Gerard has explained. Our main KPI is industrial return. This is the, the, what, what we measure as the success money comes every year to Spanish industries as industry as a supplier of these research infrastructures. We have other relevant KPIs as well. For example, collaboration agreements, like the one that I mentioned uh, between CERN, FEMAT, and, and CDTI. Also public procurement projects, the use of national funding to provide public procurement to enhance the capabilities of, for example, national research infrastructures. We are quite active in this area as well. Other KPIs can be the, I mean, the specific activities that we carry out together with the ministry to support uh, research infrastructures to be hosted in Spain, like DONES, as I explained. Also, uh, the number and the budget of preparatory R&D projects for industry, industry as a supplier of big science facilities, we have seen and, and, and there's proof that when we provide funding at an early, early stage for companies to develop their technologies, these companies are the ones that have success in tenders that go to research infrastructures. And quite often also, these companies first, they work for, they provide uh, supplies for national research infrastructures. And then they, they let's say, they, they perform the leap to international research infrastructure. So this is the, the path that we follow. First, the projects then national research infrastructure supplies for these, and then, then for international ones. And finally, we organize brokerage events and, and workshops such as the Big Science Business Forum. Where, where do we have room for improvement? Well, first, I would say on technology transfer, we are not so active on promoting technology transfer that comes from, uh, from innovations that, that that are stemmed from research infrastructures and then can be passed on to industry. We aren't involved as, uh, in the promotion of industry as a user of research infrastructures. And we, we could uh, carry out a better analysis of the industrial return, for example, trying to get more SMEs into the contracts, trying to get new companies or trying to achieve industrial return but with a more added value in some cases. So these are challenges that we, that we face. Now, uh, specifically as ILOs from a governmental agency, what are our strengths? What are our, our strong points, let's say? In the first place, I would say that uh, it is important to note that the funding for the ILO network in Spain is, is guaranteed. We are all fixed permanent staff of, of the innovation agency. So we don't have to uh, try to find funding from, uh, from other kinds of projects or, 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 or other sources. The funding is secured and, the, and this I think is important for the stability of, of our jobs. We have a, a very solid background in, in industry. All of us come from, from industry and have experience, not always in the big science market, but, but in, in technology. Then also that we work together as a team, we are oriented towards the big science market more than towards the specific, specific action in each research infrastructure. And this I think is important. It gives us synergies and it, it makes our job more valuable towards the industries. We have a very good collaboration as well with the ministry. And this gives us access to the finance committees as experts and even in some cases to councils. And as I say, this provides very good information and, and access to the key relevant person in the research infrastructures. And we also provide in exchange support to the Ministry of Science 
support for industry as a supplier mainly, and also as a co-creator for national research infrastructures as well. So we have the dual role for these national ones and international ones. We are also uh, experts. We have a nominated expert in the team in the Horizon Europe Research Infrastructures Committee, which is also very interesting and, and provides synergies. And I would also, uh, I think it's very important also that we work, uh, we work, let's say, with the ESA delegates. They belong to the same directorate as which we belong in CDTI. So we have access to the to the same database of companies. We often organize joint events, and this makes it very valuable because we often see that companies that work for ESA. Uh, we bring them on to, to working for research infrastructures or the opposite. So this creates uh, very, inter very interesting collaborations. We have access to the R&D funding instruments as well. And this is very important. Not only that, but to the project and proposals database of CDTI. And this has proven very useful when looking for new companies to provide very specific supplies to a certain research infrastructure. We have success stories there. And then we also have the benefit of, of being able to use CDTI's very powerful marketing and communication tools. And this gives the big science market and the Spanish participation in these research infrastructures a lot of visibility towards national authorities, toward the press, towards industry and all stakeholders in, in general. And finally, I, I would say that we, all, we also have funding for events, which makes it easy to, to promote our activities. Some constraints. We don't have a, science, not a scientific background in the team. We are more oriented toward business and industry. And I would say our biggest constraint as working for a governmental agency is that we are subject to national procurement rules. And this means that we have to be held accountable for every action and decision taken. We can't just suggest a company to, for a given tender, we have to make, let's say, kind of an open call every time we have to suggest companies and this can be quite complex, but this is, uh, this is uh, what goes with being uh, employed by a governmental agency. And we are very much focused on industry as a supply. So now very briefly, we, uh, we would like to talk about the, the findings of the enriched survey to ILOs. So you can see that some of the findings are aligned with what Gerard and me have talked about. For example, one of the questions of the survey was how many companies do the ILOs engage with? And what we saw in the survey is that ILOs, which are employed by governmental agencies in general, engage with a larger number of companies than ILOs who work for public research institutions. Probably because ILOs working for these kind of agencies, governmental agencies, we have access to wider databases and we cover more infrastructures, we are more, more full-time compared to the perspective of the research institutions where there are maybe more ILOs, but more folks focused on specific uh, RIs and combining this with other, other parts of their jobs. And this also can be seen in another question that was asked in the, in the survey, which dealt with the working time. You can see here that the working time for ILOs working for governmental agencies in general was reported to be higher, more close to full-time than ILOs working for, for public research organizations for the same reason. And this, I think, that matches what uh, Gerard explained in, in, in his presentation. So there are different ways of working. We are more full-time committed to the ILO role. And I think that the, the ILOs belonging to research institutions bring all the richness of their interactions with the research institutions. And that, that's very positive as well. Another question that was asked in the survey was the level, the level of, of information coming from BRIs on several aspects like geo return, procurement strategies, or the finance committee meetings. And here, I think it is noteworthy to see that uh, information that comes from the finance committee meetings, the level of information was perceived to be better for ILOs, which work for government, governmental agencies, probably because we have a better connection to our to our representatives from the ministries which go there and, and then mm, the interaction maybe is easier. So this is something that, that I think is, uh, is quite interesting. And then if we take a look at the KPIs at how employers evaluate the performance of the, of the ILOs, 
we can clearly see the two flavors of the ILO role that Gerarda Mead tried to explain. For example, when ILOs were asked how their employers uh, perceive the importance of raising geo return and the value of the national contracts, it is true that both groups of ILOs uh, rate this, this aspect of their job uh, very highly, but ILOs belonging to agencies rate it even higher. You can see that there's 94% of ratings which, uh, between four and five, which are the highest ratings compared to 76% in public research organizations. And the same trend can, can be seen if we take a look at the, the KPI of, of improving the supplier base for the research infrastructures. It is a bit higher for ILOs with, which work for agencies. But the opposite trend can be seen in these uh, a bit different uh, aspects of the ILO role, like promoting technology transfer activities or promoting collaborations between industry, infrastructures, and university. And here you can we can see that ILOs, that an employer, the, the employers of the ILOs which work for public research organizations have a higher rating of these activities compared to us who work in, in governmental agencies. So, so their, their job is more, um, is more diverse, let's say. They, they, they have a specific role in, in looking for these collaborations, uh, technology transfer activities, and so on. So uh, as a conclusion, we could say that uh, the first conclusion is that there could be there is more to the ILO role than only the role of industry as a supplier, promoting industry as a supplier. And uh, we can create synergies between the other goals like raising your return, creating co-development and promoting te technology transfer. Second yes. conclusion. Yeah, get out of, go ahead. And the second one, yes, I already explained it. Uh, from from the survey, uh, it shows that there is there is there is uh, there is uh, much di diversity, and I think that um, it is worthwhile to get some more information about uh, about this diversity. And uh, at least I think it would be it would be good to have more official job descriptions uh, through uh, throughout the, the, the throughout Europe and, and Europe, European countries and uh, well at least that uh, that would that would definitely improve uh, mutual understanding between uh, between the islands and uh, I think uh, of course this will this will also be beneficial for uh, for for the countries uh, in, in in Europe and 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 the the promotion of uh, of innovation. Another conclusion that we think is important is that uh, it is it is very interesting and imp and relevant to share our success stories to learn what works for for in each country and what doesn't work. So uh, and, and there's also this this. Uh, diversity of roles between ILOs that can provide um, like new ways of working, new tools, uh, new, new, even new KPIs for, for the different ILOs. So, so I think that Enrich can be very, be very valuable, not only cooperating between ILOs, but also with ICOs, working with industry as a supplier of distributed research infrastructures. So we can all learn a lot from each other. Yes, and I already mentioned uh, this this innovation chain. And from our perspective in the Netherlands, uh, we 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 see companies that are highly interested in in activities in the the low TRL uh, technology area, but find it extremely difficult to uh, access the market. Uh, well, th this should be seen as as I think a strategic investment for companies. Um, but uh, in this strategic investment, uh, they need more support from the ministries and from an ecosystem in which uh, all the stakeholders have, um, have common goals. So that's something, uh, at least in the Netherlands, uh, what we have to, uh, where we have to look at, uh, that we have a better connection uh, from low TRL development to uh, applications in the market. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, so I think, yeah. with this, we finish. Thank you. I give the floor to Nigel again for the question and answer session. Thank you, Javier, for a very comprehensive presentation. We are uh, indeed now really looking in, in more detail at the ILO role and uh, aspects of it and differences between different countries. Um, the floor is now open for discussion, so I would like to invite all the participants to uh, start their videos if they wish um, and to unmute themselves and to uh, post questions uh, or um, comments from their own experience relating to this, this topic, um, because um, there will be quite a, a range of experience, I think, uh, of people in among the participants in the audience. So. Uh, with that, uh, please, uh, I invite you to enter discussion. There are no immediate questions. There were a couple of points in the chat uh, about the AIATRIS business model. Um, I don't know if anybody would like to um, to put those questions to to Chris or if he could answer from from the chat uh, relating to how our eyes react to the, uh, the fee structure, the business model. Chris, yeah, I can I can say a bit about it, obviously. Um, so the five percent is added on top of the budget, so it's paid. Yeah, uh, so hi, I'm Angela Zanaro. I'm the one that put the, that question. Sorry, ah, good, good. <laughs> sorry, start the video. I had some problem with starting the video. That was the one, uh, the reason why it was silent. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me now, but yeah, we can. Okay, yeah, we can. thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I mean, I'm working from Sa for CERIC, that is another HERIC on, uh, well, Central European Research Infrastructure uh, Consortium that is very focused on material science, uh, advanced material nanotechnology. And uh, I was a little bit curious about uh, the model regarding the 5% because uh, uh, sometimes it, it can uh, create some frictions uh, among the research infrastructure that are part of the consortium, maybe in, in order that uh, uh, I don't know how it works in Eatris, if they have their own ILOs, uh, they they sell their own services, uh, or you are the only one selling that those services. Well, uh, the the best way to explain it is that the five percent is for fee for service project. So a biotech or pharma company is looking for wants an academic group to do a specific experiment for them. So the 5% is paid by the company on top of the budget that is set by the academic group. Mm -hmm. That is one. Two, we do put a cap on it. I mean, mm -hmm. if it's a million dollar project and we don't feel that 5%, we, we feel that that's too much, basically, yeah. for the work that we do. Uh, because in a way, it's our finder fee and it's also our sort of negotiation Okay. E service, if, if if you will. So we put a, we put a cap on it, and usually the companies are happy because we search for them at more than hundred institutes at the same time instead of them having to email every single PI at every single university. So everybody's. Yeah. No, I understand. Uh, my point is that if in case uh, a project of or a need from a company needs uh, just the. Uh, capabilities and knowledge from one of the of your partners uh, you act in any way like uh, in this case like a broker like uh, with uh, these five percent for the service of putting in contract coordinating the setting up of the collaboration or you act in this case uh, without this five percent and just acting like a liaison uh, putting in contact with the company directly with the academic group or we, we act as a broker if in we... any case okay yeah yeah. Okay, but this, but again, this is only for fee for service projects. No, yeah, understand, understand. And in that case, uh, it, it's fine. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Sure. Chris, can I? If I, I'm being, just jumping in. It's Ed Mitchell from the European Synchrotron. When when you've got you've got a hundred things, hundred facilities or universities you can call upon. How do you how do you decide who gets the business if there's three that could answer? Um, so, so usually what happens, say there's a request for a certain uh, you know, animal study. So, so you need to find a group that has a specific animal model 
that is also interested in this collaboration. So let's say that we get mm. five responses back. That's already manageable. So mm -hmm. if we feel that those five are quality groups, then we introduce all five of them to the company. Wow. And then the company can choose who they'd like to explore a collaboration with. So they either want to set up a call uh, with all five or yeah. perhaps start with one that because of uh, geographical yeah. reasons. Yeah, okay, uh, language barriers, culture. Yeah, okay. True, yeah, but sometimes we need to we need to disappoint uh, some of our students, <laughs> unfortunately, but that's how it goes. And do you do you do you try to do any kind of like long term averaging, so that if you've got the same type of request coming in on a kind of constant basis, you sort of roll it out across the consortia to different partners so that they all get a slice of the pie. To be honest, we never really get the same request twice. Okay, all right, so it's very diverse. A similar request, like we get requests for biological samples, so they want basically. Yeah tiny slices of tumor samples, right? Uh -huh. uh, but they're generally like different types of tumors, different numbers, uh, okay. you know. Okay. And do, do you, so, sorry, if I, I'm gonna, this is my last one, I'm gonna shut up, right? Cause yep. I've got to go and pick up the kids in a minute. Um, <laughs> and how, because you've got quite a diversity spread across Europe. So also the pricing is gonna vary, right? Because without being, without being too something, right? Uh, one person hour in Switzerland is very expensive. One person hour in Greece is cheap by comparison. Does that start to play in a role when you've got such a wide geographical set of options? Well, not necessarily because because there's also quality involved, right? Uh, so generally, yeah. it would be easier for a company to work with an academic group that already works with other companies because they're used to uh, basically mm -hmm. the timelines and the, the type of projects, uh, etc. Um, we always warn companies that uh, they shouldn't go for cheap because <laughs> okay. that, that, that doesn't that doesn't generally doesn't lead anywhere. I'm sure you can imagine why. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else uh, with uh, a question on this topic or others? Yeah, I could raise a question uh, as a panelist if you don't mind, uh, Nigel. Sure. Okay, I was uh, interested in um, to hear from people from other domains if the uh, fragmentation of the ICO role is playing uh, is is uh, uh, is playing a role there as well. Uh, so I described that uh, we have a distributed research infrastructure with people working on uh, uh, with a task in reaching out to stakeholders. Uh, from a local perspective and from the ERIC perspective, but it's never uh, a full-time job for the entire ERIC. It's part of a whole list of responsibilities, uh, which complicates the visibility, etc. So the, uh, my question is, is this also playing, uh, this model also, um, uh, can this also be observed in other domains? So maybe, maybe the... Um, uh, Chris from Ayatris uh, could say something there, uh, or representatives with an ICO role in the other parties around this table. Well, maybe we could ask participants, uh, which of you uh, identifies with the ICO role and which aspects of it? You seem there are different uh, different aspects to it, uh, dealing with industry in various uh, capacities. Maybe somebody would like to comment from their uh, from their domain or RI. So at the at the European Synchrotron in the BizDev office, we we um, match up with the ICO role in industry as a user, tech transfer, collaboration, but not procurement, which is very clearly a different set of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, you have them all in one place or at several places? Uh, so the ISREF is a centralized, as a central yes, single. Uh -huh, yeah, okay, yeah, fair point. Yeah, 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 yeah but we're, yeah. We're, and we're separated by two floors, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay, totally different model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, which, um, uh, I, I would like to ask um, the, the, an issue that comes up time again is uh, how to enhance 
you know, technology transfer and innovation to industry as a user. Uh, and this is, I think, an area where we perceive potential, unrealized potential, both within the ICO and the ILO roles. Uh, I would like to ask the ILOs uh, what they would really see as major steps forward in or initiatives to make steps forward in that direction. Maybe Javier was one of your uh, one of your areas for, for concern. Maybe you could comment what you would most like to see. Yes, thank you, Nigel. Well, uh, as I said, uh, technology, we in CDTI, we have not been very active in technology transfer, but we are making steps. Uh, for example, uh, as all of you know, in the Big Science Business Forum, we have a very significant track called the, the, the technology transfer track of BSBF in which we would like to see, and especially to, to have success stories of technologies developed in the realm of the big science world, transferred to other markets like the energy sector, the healthcare sector, uh, consumer, I don't know, whichever. So, um, so I think we, we, we need to promote this through specific activities, but we also need to be able to come up with some success stories to convince companies that there is a you can there's a crossover from all these investments that you have to carry out to be able to to provide services to CERN or fusion for energy and then use this for for other for other domains. I'm not sure okay. if I answered your question, but this is what we are trying to aim. No, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. And and uh, you shouldn't look uh, exclusively uh, uh, at the role of, of industry as a user, uh, Nigel, because uh, even in the, in the situation that industry is a supplier, uh, at least our ILOs can spot the possibilities for technology transfer. So in this initial stage of, let's say, these, these low TRL developments, there may certainly be uh, possibilities, opportunities for technology transfer that can be spotted by ILOs. And I think that should be a role, that should be a, a distinctive role of ILOs also. Also when we talk about industry as a supplier. Thank you, good point, yeah. Nigel, I, I, am, I am Jorge Lopez also from CDTI and I also would like to comment something about uh, the role of ILOs uh, in technology transfer. When uh, Gerard uh, comment uh, the, the, the ideal profile of an ILO, uh, you mentioned that uh, it, it, sh it should be good to have a, a technology background. And I do agree with, with you, Gerard. But the question is that nowadays, if you would like to cover many uh, research infrastructures, you won't be able to cover all the technologies with the uh, proper level of knowledge just to uh, cover properly a technology transfer. That's a, that's a problem because uh, although we think we know everything about everything, this is not true. And uh, therefore, um, in, I think um, we can animate, we can promote technology transfer, but if you would like to take the hand of uh, the research infrastructure up to uh, an industry just to make uh, the technology transfer happen, you have to be very, uh, you have to have a very deep knowledge of the, of, of the technology you are dealing with. This is, this is, this is the point. In some cases, if, if you are an expert on um, astronomy, only on astronomy, then you can do this job uh, for astronomy but not for all big science matters. This is my point of view. Okay, thanks very much. Of course, of course, uh, Jorge, uh, you are right, but I would say first, uh, perhaps we should have much more ILOs <laughs> throughout Europe, that's one. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are talking about, of course, uh, in, in big science at least, about uh, key technologies that are very specific in our case for big science and the physical infrastructures. 
And uh, of course, many of these key technologies are shared between several disciplines. If you are looking at accelerators, uh, well, there are many kinds of accelerators uh, spread, uh, spread over many disciplines. And the same holds for, 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 for astronomy. So there are several disciplines uh, that make use of, of the same key technologies. So it's important also to identify the key technologies that are important for big science, which is already uh, going on, by the way, at least at, at the European level. Mm. Uh, but, but not but, through uh, research infrastructures. They don't play a role there. It's, it's maybe, maybe directly... Yes, also, I think also the research infrastructures uh, should have a task there by developing uh, te technology roadmaps, for instance. So I think matching, uh, matching the requirements of an, of an RI with, with what a country, specific country can supply, uh, there's also something that, uh, that needs attention. Can I bring up just before half past four one uh, other topic that hasn't been addressed? I'm just curious. Uh, it's just curiosity. I would like to understand if in uh, the community of uh, ILOs, uh, in spite of all the differences, I just used that one term, uh, whether you um, uh, see a role for ILOs in uh, bringing um, AI technologies, artificial intelligence, um, um, uh, whether to create any business out of, of that field or whether that's also left to academia and, and industry alone. Could you answer fairly quickly, um, ILO, so that we can round off this discussion before people leave? Or do you leave the data industry uh, outside uh, your scope and, and only focus on what you call big science, which I call big money? <laughs> I, I think artificial intelligence can be very important for big science also. So my, uh, my answer would be, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, add it to the list of key technologies that are important. But of course, that, 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 should, all, all, that, that, that should be stated also uh, from the side of the, of the RIs. If there is a need for knowledge, yes. Of course. Yeah, well, there is an offer of knowledge. I was actually talking uh, from the perspective of industry as a user. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. I would <clears throat> like to leave the discussion now and thanks to our speakers and participants. But before you leave us, <clears throat> before you leave us, and thank you, by the way, for your participation, um, <clears throat> I would give the floor to Laurent for uh, a short poll, uh, which he will uh, put you now and you will also receive by email um, a questionnaire based on this material so thanks again Laurent can you take it from here